Okay, just a, a quick review on what has happened. In 1 Samuel 18, David was promoted to Gibeah, to the king's court, to the palace, to the White House, if you will. And things could not have been going better. The young maidens of Israel were singing David's praises. Uh, he was uh, established as head of the entire army. He was invited to marry the king's daughter. He became the, the son-in-law of the king. Everything was going well. His family was a little bit overwhelmed and impressed at, at the favor of the Lord upon his life. I need you to turn this down a bit, guys, back there. Just keep, turn it down a little bit. And thank you. And so they uh, are, uh, you know, really blessed in all that's going on in his life. And then suddenly jo uh, Saul's jealousy, his, the demon that he's been feeding of jealousy and anger and rage, and he's been nurturing it, it's finally taken possession of David's heart, I mean of Saul's heart and life. And Saul begins to attack David, of course. And he's driven out of the court temporarily. And then Jonathan intercedes for David. He goes to Saul and says, Father, you know, let's let him have one more chance. He really isn't the kind of guy you think. And so David's reinstituted back into Saul's court. And then a couple wars break out with the Philistines. Possibly a few years go by. It's hard to know. It doesn't really tell us, but we know it's some months at least. And then that, that demonic rage comes over Saul again. And he picks up the, the, uh, the spear and he begins to uh, throw it at David. And, you know, it's business as usual. So David takes off in 1 Samuel 21 and he goes to the city of Nob and he tells the lies. He tells the lies, and the priests of the city of Nob are, are slaughtered by the lies that David is told, and all kinds of disaster takes place. And we looked at that last week, and the shame that breaks loose in David's life, and how he has to find the Lord in the midst of this. Then in 1 Samuel 22, he escapes to the cave of Adullam. And we looked at that last week, Psalm 57 and Psalm 142, and the different ways that he discovers the Lord in the depths of depression. Things are really going difficult for, for David. And 1 Samuel 23 uh, takes us right uh, to the place where we, where, we, where we begin tonight. 1 Samuel 23, verse 1. Then they told David, saying, Look, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah, and they're robbing the threshing floors. Verse 2. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. Now, I think it's, it's an amazing reality that David's even asking. Remember, he just, I mean, he just has experienced the trauma just, I mean, could be some weeks before of the massacre of the priests of the city of Nob. He's been in incredible depression, as described in Psalm 142, which is taken from the cave of Adullam beginning in depression, in the shame of the slaughter of the city of the priests in the city of Nob. And David finds this boldness and tenacity to operate in the sphere that God's called him to. Because God has called him, has anointed him to destroy the Philistines. Of course, David could easily reason, well, Lord, I'll operate in that grace and that anointing when, once you get rid of Saul. And the Lord's answer is, David, that anointing is on you now, not just when Saul's taken care of. I anointed you to destroy the Philistines, not only when you became king, but from the day the anointing came on you forward, from that day forward. And so I can't imagine having the inward resolve to engage in a war against the Philistines with no army, spiritually depressed, the massacre of the city of priests behind you, 600 now discontented men. It's grown from 400 to 600. And David says, he hears the report that the Philistines are, are robbing the threshing floors and that's in the outskirts of the city. And the threshing floors is where all their wheat is being stored the, uh, of the Israelites. I mean, David could easily say, well, let them take care of it. You know, I'm really in a bad way. I mean, I've really had a bad couple months. But David goes before the Lord and he inquires in verse 2, Shall I attack? I think that's an, just an incredible question for David to be asking in the midst of 
midst of his last month and all that's taken place. Now, when David inquires of the Lord, the, if you, re, if you uh, re, uh, remember the ephod, that linen that the high priest has, remember all the priests were destroyed, and Ahimelech has died, and, he's, and his son Abathar now has the ephod, which has the Urim and the Thummim in it. And again, nobody knows exactly how that operates, but the, the common uh, concept is that it was two stones of which the king could, answer, could get a yes or no uh, question from the Lord answered definitively. Yes or no. Basically, as if they asked the question right, they could get real specific information. So David basically is going to Abathar, who's just you know, equally traumatized as he is, and he says, I want you to go before the Lord with the ephod, and find out, is it yes or is it no, shall we attack? Go and attack, the Lord says. You know, sometimes the greatest solution that God gives us in the midst of the depression of Psalm 142 is attack. Our flesh says, draw back, lick our wounds, hide away, and just forget everybody because everybody mistreats us. But the Lord tells David, your healing will be partially found in getting out of the comfort zone and standing out on the water, get out of the boat, and, and get in the flow of the life of God and fight the enemies of God. It's the uh, thing when Elisha went to the widow and asked her for oil. And she had just a little bit of oil, and she gave what she had, and the oil continued to flow and flow and flow. And the Lord often tells us to give the little bit that we have, and then more takes place. Some of you right now are in the shame that David had, or the depression David had from Nob or the early days of Adullam, and the Lord is telling you, rise up and go get about the purpose of the Lord. Don't get introspective, and don't lick your wounds, or rise up and attack, and you will find me in the attack, which is exactly what David did. He found a fresh expression, a fresh release of the power of God. I don't doubt that David was a little anxious as to exactly what would happen. I mean, he's done, had a pretty horrendous last month or two, which could uh, you could describe as not in the power of the Lord. He, that's at least probably what David would have said. If you remember the Psalms we read, Lord, nobody cares about me. Lord, You have left me. You've hidden Your face from me. Sorrow overwhelms me. My heart is crushed. It's over. It's over. It's over. And finally, he comes around to, yes, Lord, but because of Your mercy, You have made me like a green olive tree. And the Lord's saying, okay, let the oil flow then. Attack. Attack the enemies of the Lord. I've always pondered at that statement in verse 2 because of the timing of it. You know, he just had a major car wreck, and someone says, hey, I just want you to start a new workout regime. You know, like, well, I'm kind of a little broken right now. No, just start right now. Start working those new muscles at this very moment. Verse 3, David's men said to him, look, we are afraid here in Judah. And Keilah is, is a city of Judah. Now, remember why they're in Judah, because the prophet Gad in chapter 22, 5 tells them, don't go to Moab and don't go to Gath. Don't go to any other country. Moab is where David was finding refuge from the king of Moab, or Gath he was finding refuge from, the, from Achish king of Gath, because he knew Saul wouldn't go in those two places. And the prophet said, go right where the fire is. Go into the heat of where it's uncomfortable. Go to Judah. Now, you know that God knew in chapter 22, 5, when he said, go to Judah and stay there, God knew Chapter 23, that Keilah, which is in Judah, was going to have trouble. God knew that. And He says, go there, and you will find my power in the midst of trouble. David says, Lord, I don't need any more trouble. I'm, I'm healing right now. I don't need any more tests. I don't need any more anything. And the Lord says, you need to look at something besides yourself, and I'm going to use you in the midst of your brokenness right now. Go to Keilah. And his men, and they were... Pretty rough crowd. Even they were afraid. They said, David, not Judah. Saul's in Judah. And David says, well, tell the Lord or tell Gad to tell the Lord or somebody. But the Lord insists, go to Judah. He says, how much more afraid are we if we go to Key Island and fight against the armies of the Philistines? He goes, man, this is intense. And yet David has this boldness. To go forward. I mean, he has this lies and all this shame behind him. And David inquires of the Lord again. And the Lord doesn't 
doesn't mind that. The Lord doesn't mind us getting the confirmation. He says, back in verse, uh, in verse 4, He says, Lord, are you sure? I mean, I've really had a, a rough month or two. I've told us some lies. I've caused some tragedy, tragedy. I'm real depressed. The team is real divided. They're filled with fear. This really isn't a great time for a military victory. And the Lord says, it's a perfect time for a breakthrough and a victory. Yeah, but Lord, we're not in good shape. And the Lord says, then there'll be no question as to where the victory comes from. And God wanted to give David an experience in the mercy of God and in the power of God in His brokenness. And again, in our religion and in our legalism, we get this idea that we have to get patched up first, then we'll experience God's power. And the Lord says, I want you to experience my power as part of the method of patching you up. So David's a little beat up, so he wants confirmation in verse 4. And he inquires of the Lord once again. He says, Lord, are you sure? The team doesn't like it. Nobody likes it. I'm a little weary right now. Remember Psalm 142, verse 3, David says, nobody, I mean, verse 4, he goes, nobody likes me. Nobody cares for me. He goes, I'm all by myself. That was literally just before this event. You have to put those psalms together to really get the picture here. The Lord answers, arise. Go down to Keilah. Again, they're, they're, it's all within the... Uh, the, the, the uh, county, if you will, of Judah, within the, the tribal boundaries of Judah, which is very small. It's not very big, you know. Just a few miles each direction. I will deliver the Philistines into your hand. I will anoint you. I will have a breakthrough. I will be fresh in your life again. Go down there and meet me. Get out of the comfort zone, David. It's a great story, isn't it? Until the Lord tells us, in the same circumstance, Lord, I'm bankrupt. I just got caught in lies. I'm depressed. All my friends don't like me. I've been excommunicated. The Lord says, I'd rise and attack and I'll be with you. Well, Lord, I'd rather read a biography and get my faith built up about how you acted in somebody's life and history. No, I want to give you an experience in the grace of God right now, David. Arise and go after the enemies of God. Instead of the Philistines, just put the enemies of God. Let me use you in the power of God, David. So David and his men, I don't know how he convinced the men, but they came, they went with him. They, somewhere in verse 5, the men overcome their fear. Because they have to overcome their fear to arise up with David to go after this thing. And they fought with the Philistines and struck them with a mighty blow. Took away all their livestock. And of course, livestock were just that. They were, they were the livelihood of a city. So they take all of the supplies from the Philistines and then they can give them to the city there that's being destroyed. I mean, what a turnaround victory. And they save the, inhabit the inhabitants of Keilah. What a story. Look at that, verse 5. Struck them with a mighty blow. You know, one of the things that uh, I didn't know early on in the Lord, but I've experienced a few my, in my own life, but uh, more so through my readings, uh, the stories that, that I have of some of the greatest missionary stories in history were in the midst of the most broken lives you could imagine and despair. It's just, it's just hard to imagine the real story behind the glorified story. I'll, I'll just tell you, I'll tell you one just kind of silly little story in my own life. <clears throat> I, I, it was just, it was graphic to, uh, to me. It had nothing to do with life and death and the saving of a city or anything, but I remember it was a conference. We were doing it downtown. Maybe it was in 93 or 94. I can't remember. It was one of our annual conferences downtown. And, and, and I remember the course of the week I had the Wednesday morning meeting. I can remember it vividly. And I think we started Sunday night or, or we had a lot going on, you know, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, a lot of people in town, maybe probably 5,000 people at the conference and people from everywhere and stayed up late Sunday night, early Monday morning, late Monday night, early Tuesday morning, late Tuesday night. And, and uh, I decided instead of staying at the hotel downtown, I'd go home and, and uh, just so I could get away from, quote, the fellowship and get ready for the session the next morning on Wednesday morning. And so I get home real late and I'm so exhausted. You know what it's like when you're absolutely exhausted. And so I asked Diane, my wife, to set the alarm. I said, set the alarm for 6.30, you know, because I have to leave the house at 8. And that's just barely, you know, just kind of wake up, get a few cups of coffee and get going. I was so tired. And through a series of events, the alarm doesn't get set.
To this day, we don't know what really happened, but that's we're waiting for the judgment seat to really get the truth of this thing. It doesn't matter right now. What happens is the alarm goes off. I mean, I wake up at 8.45. Of course, the session's at 9 o'clock. And uh, I'm not very happy. Of course, my first question is a question of accusations. Why didn't you? And, of course, then why didn't you? And then we got in a little intense fellowship and uh, <laughs> let the reader understand. And I was just really in the flesh to the max. And so now it's about 9.15. And I go outside and there's a guy on my porch, sitting on my front porch. He wants a ride to downtown to the conference. Now, this guy has a conflict with me and his conflict with me is, I don't really even know him, but he's written me a couple letters. In his conflict, he made a, a formal protest against me. I don't care about him. I don't even know him, but he's somehow he, he didn't have a job for a year, and he, won, he thought I should take responsibility for him, and da-da-da-da, I told him no. And so it was a real conflict. He's on my porch. He says the Lord told him that da-da-da-da. So I'm really unhappy now. So I got this guy that I'm in this real conflict with, and his conflict is I don't care about him. So he wants to tell me his story. Well, I'm not even awake yet, and I'm, I'm, I'm asleep, and I'm mad, and I'm super tired. So I asked Diane, I said, could you, like, talk to this guy for 30 minutes while we drive down so that I could kind of, like, think a little bit of what I'm going to do? I mean, there are 5,000 people down there, and I, I kind of got to get connected. And she's kind of upset, and she goes, no. <laughs> she goes, you talk to him. <laughs> And I said, I gotta kick into a quick strategy. I gotta get into some serious humility to get her happy and apologize, or I gotta talk to him. Either way it goes, I gotta, I'm really in a bind. So I don't do it, I just get mad at her and him. Now he's really upset at me, sitting in the back seat going, you really don't care about anybody, do you? And I'm just like, he's just speaking, you know. I'm burning. I'm mad at everybody. I get downtown. Of course, there's a little traffic jam, and so I get down there about 9.45. The session starts at 9. The worship's over at 9.45. And, of course, since there's 5,000 people, there's no parking spot. So I park a mile and a half away, and it's 110 degrees, and it's really hot. And it's, I have to park some distance away. And, and of course, the, the conference-itis thing sets in. And that means, you know, at a conference, it's real normal, so I'm not upset about this, but it just was a bad deal. Just the old, you know, every 20 feet, somebody stops to tell you a dream or vision or story. And so about the fifth time, somebody stopped me and said, oh, this must be the Lord. You're here, and I want to tell you this. And they touch my arm, I'm about to scream. If one more person touches me and says, stop, I'm in such a big hurry. And I'm just like holding, I said, I really can't. And then so says, you know, you guys don't really care about anybody. I go, oh, <laughs> So I, I'm walking, and one more guy touches me, guy seven or eight. I, you know, just, hey, hey, this must be the Lord. I want to tell you something. I'm just, uh, like, I can't talk right now, and I'm holding my, I have no idea what I'm going to do when I get up there. I get on the platform. Of course, one of my big principles is I want everybody who's ministering on time. So I get up, and uh, one of the guys leading the meeting says, I thought you wanted us on time. And I said, oh, oh, I can't take it. I can't take one more sentence right now. And I just said, yeah. He says, well, where have you been? I said, doesn't matter. Fifteen minutes later, I open the Bible. I am so, I am such a wreck. It is unbelievable. I turned to Song of Solomon. I said, turn to Song of Solomon. I asked, you know, I didn't, I said, that's a good place to go. <laughs> and I'm just going to read it and see what happens. And about the 30, 20, I don't even know, minute mark, whatever, the energy of the Lord enters into this room interrupts my preaching, I stop, people are weeping everywhere, four or five thousand people. I'm weeping, they're weeping, the ministry time goes on an hour, hour and fifteen, twenty minutes. It's, it's an incredible what happened. Even to this day, I still get letters in the mail from that meeting. I was at that meeting, what happened? I was so blown away by what took place. I said, how did this happen? And then I had a... Uh, a meeting with a, a bunch of students, Korean students from Seattle. About 40 of them were down, and, and they were afterwards, and they're all we'll ask questions. You know, we have an hour session, and the first question is, how do you prepare for a meeting like this? <laughs> and 
And I said, you don't really want to know. They said, no, really, this was so awesome. And I, I have to admit, and it was probably one of the two or three strongest times the Lord has ever used me in my life in preaching, ever. Not that it's that strong, but in comparison to anything that I've ever experienced, the power of God broke in amongst us, the people, and people just started kneeling down. I don't want to say falling. That's a little exaggerated. But thousands of them were on the ground. They were sobbing and crying out to God. Just interrupted the message. And I didn't finish the message. And I said, well, you, you don't really want to know. They said, no, we want to know the secret to preparing a message like this. And I said, they thought it was really awesomely humble. I said, confidence in the mercy of God. They go, oh, that's so cool. You just really love the Lord. I go, you have no idea what I'm talking about right now. Then I told them the story. And they were so disillusioned. I mean, a couple of them were encouraged, but a couple of them were so disillusioned. They go, you know, because they were kind of wanting somebody who walked on water, not, you know, broken people who God has mercy on. A few of them were actually a little upset by the story. I told them the story. Anyway, sometimes I, I think of when I read this passage, that story comes to my mind. Arise and attack. Because what I wanted to do was, and I don't think it would have been bad to, uh, to do this, to call up and say, hey, guys, it ain't going to happen today. I mean, it's not big, that big deal. A meeting's just a meeting. It's just a meeting. So what? It's not that big of an issue. You know, just have somebody else do it. But for some reason, that, I don't know, I just went down there and I was so filled with frustration and anger and just, I was mad at everybody. I had like eight people I was mad at when I started. I just gave one of those hypocritical prayers. Oh, God, let your spirit, da, da, da. And he did it. People say, man, that's a mystery. I go, well, it's not really. That's really how it works. That really is how it operates. I'm not undermining the place of having a life in God. But I'm telling you, you don't stand and pray for somebody or lead someone to the Lord or approach a prayer meeting based on what you did in the last 72 hours or the last two or three weeks. I don't do that. I don't take my recent track record into my prayer closet. I don't do that. If I've had a tremendous three weeks, that doesn't do it. The pay is the same, truly. I go, Lord, I love you even though my love is immature and you love me ferociously and the grace of Jesus is available. Therefore, let's do it. Let's, let's go for it. Let our hearts interact together. And if it doesn't, that's your business, Lord. And if it does, I'll know what the real story is and what the real, what the real record is before the Lord. And the Lord's record is, I mean, the, the records or the, or the true story is what I mean by... Uh, by the record is that God shows mercy upon His people. I've had several examples like this where I was horrendously carnal and I had the power of God operate in my life. That's just the most graphic one because that was two or three of the most... It'd be, I can think of three occasions where I ministered the Word of God and God broke in upon the people in an unusual way with sobbing and weeping that wasn't called forth, it wasn't ministry time, it just happened. And it was all unpremeditated, and that was the most graphic illustration. Although, I've had a couple times where I was really in the flesh, and the Lord healed people in outstanding ways. I remember one time I, I, I went to a meeting, and I was really, it wasn't, I didn't have quite the lineup I just described, but I was really feeling horrible. And Bob Jones got up at the meeting, and some of you know Bob Jones, a prophetic man in our early history, and he said, Lord showed me that Mike, God's going to use Mike uh, in creative healings tonight. So Tuesday night, and I said, Bob, just shut up. I said, come on, I'm like really tired. I'm in a bad mood. I don't feel like it. The worship, I didn't like the worship. I didn't like nothing tonight. Anybody ever feel like that? And I was there, and he says, oh, yeah. He says, Lord's going to use you in creative healings. He goes, if you need a creative miracle, I mean something that needs to be created from nothing, come on up, and Mike will pray for you. I, I did, I'm not going to take pressure. Like I got up and I said, I feel horrible. If you want to come up, all the half of them went and sat back down. But anyway, one lady came up. She goes, tomorrow I'm getting a massive, complete hysterectomy. She says, I'm in serious trouble tomorrow. And if they say, if I don't get it, I, you know, it will end up, I'll end up dying. It's, it's, it's really, really a serious deal. And she described it. And I prayed for her and felt nothing. Prayed for about three, four minutes, and Bob was standing there. He goes, keep praying. He says, don't quit. I said, Lord, healer. Healer, more Lord. Healer. I was mad that he made me do this, that Bob did this.
He said, Bob, this manipulation. He goes, well, we'll see. And she was instantly healed. She went the next day and the doctor said, we cannot understand this. You are totally healed. She came back weeping and I said, what was that? And the answer is, it's not about how good you've been in the last three weeks. It's not about your recent track record. You love me, I love you. I mean, there's a sincerity that we have, but there's immaturity. There's, I felt horrible that night. I don't always feel horrible. I felt extra horrible that night. I mean, I, I, I remember vividly feeling depressed during the worship, during the whole meeting. And when Bob did that, I actually said, Bob, I don't appreciate it. I actually gave him a soft rebuke. I said, I don't appreciate the pressure. He goes, it's not about you and pressure. The Lord wants to show you something. He wants to show you it's really not about you and how you're doing right now. It's bigger than that. It's about His grace. It's about His power to deliver others. See, this wasn't just about God showing David he could flow in the power of God. It was about God saving a city. There's many, many different angles that God's operating on when this happens. And I've had a number of other stories where the Lord used me to lead someone to the Lord when I didn't want to lead somebody to the Lord. I remember one time when I was witnessing to a I witnessed to, I made this promise to the Lord I would witness to somebody every day. And so after some months go by, Nobody met the Lord. I was, it was getting worse. It was just, I, was, I hated witnessing because I was like, oh, for a hundred, you know, the last three months. And I witnessed somebody every single day. I made a promise to the Lord I would. Because I read it in some book, you know, and the Lord, I said, Lord, let me off of that dumb promise. And I just assumed that, that he said yes because he's been kind to me ever since I broke that promise. It's been a lot of years ago. But I pick up this hitchhiker, this hitchhiker. I got a couple hours, and I always picked up every hitchhiker so I could witness to him. And I pick up this hitchhiker, and he says, what do you do? Well, I'm a pastor of a church. I said, just stuff. <laughs> he goes, what do you mean? I said, you know, a little here, a little there. He goes, well, what do you do? I, I don't want to tell him. I don't want to witness to him. I got three, two hours. I, I want to show kindness to him, but I don't want to talk to him about God. He looks down. He sees my Bible. He goes, what's that? He says, a book. He opened it up, and I had it all marked up. He goes, my goodness. He goes, have you read this thing a lot? I go, oh, I was so close to saying it's my brother's. But I said, yeah. He said, how, uh, how why? I said, well, it's, I like it, you know. He goes, well, how do you know God? I'm really in a bind. I've made a commitment. I'm not going to witness anymore. I'm mad at the Lord. And I said, you know, through Jesus. He goes, can I know God? And I went, oh. <laughs> and I said, sure. And he said, actually, there's two of them. There's one good primary guy talking. Actually, they're on their way to go to Colorado to kill somebody who stole drugs from them. They're going to murder him. I don't know that for, a couple, for about two or three years later because both of them got converted in the car that night and they came back and lived with me for about two or three years. But... And so the one guy's talking, and he goes, can, can we know God? And the other guy goes, what? He goes, no, this is amazing. Look at this Bible. Just because I put a lot of marks in it, you know, kind of somehow struck him. And I'll tell you, I led them both to the Lord that night. And I just kept saying, you know, I, I just, I got some friends you could talk to. They said, no, well, tell us what happened to you. And I said, <laughs> I was trying to hold this one out. And I led them both to the Lord. They got powerfully converted, and they lived in, in uh couple years with us in a discipleship setting. It was actually, they lived in my house, and they led groups, and da-da-da-da. So I just got a number of those stories over the years when I just was really, really in one of those difficult ways. Now, David's story is a little more intense. Again, he's caused the murder of a city. Oh, yeah, I'm not even going to tell you the sins I did that kind of, like, depressed me. I'm not even going to tell you that part of it. It's just the kind of stuff that you do. So just think of it that way. Verse 5. And the Lord struck them with a mighty blow. I have, I have seen the mighty blow of the Lord. Relative speaking, of course, bring it way down to our little lives and what we're accustomed to. I'm using the word mighty blow in a very, very limited context. And I've been in the most difficult places in the Lord. Meaning, not feeling anything. And I don't mean just that He used me. It's more than just He used me. It's that he was romancing my heart when I was absolutely in a difficult position. And I, didn't want, and I got to the place where I was hurt and I didn't want to go forward. I said, I don't want to do it right now. I don't want to. 
I'll do it later. I don't want to right now. And he used me in power. I have quite a, a few other stories like that, but David, he lays aside his self-pity in verse 5. He lays aside his condemnation. The burden he has for the 600 men that are afraid, he brings them in to the faith with him. I think this is an astounding story for uh, Samuel 23, Keilah. Because when you take the, the city of Nob, the lies, the cave of Adullam, the depression, no friends, crushed of spirit, all these things, it makes you really want to go back to Psalm 142 and find out in Psalm 57 exactly what, God, what David did to connect him for the victory here in chapter 23 of, of uh, 1 Samuel. The green olive tree. David said, I'm a green olive tree. Psalm 52, 8, last week. It is flowing with oil. Verse 6. Now it happened when Abathar, he's the, uh, <clears throat> the, the only surviving priest, so by default he is now the high priest. He went down with an ephod in his hand. And he fled to David at Keilah. Saul was told that David had gone into Keilah, to the city. And Saul said, Look at this religious language. I mean, when you have no discernment, you interpret everything wrong. God has delivered David into my hands. For David has been shut himself into by entering into a town that has gates and bars. David has entered into a walled city where there's only a front door. There's no back door. <clears throat> Saul said, I know Keilah. I know the city well. I've been there. He goes, David's on the inside of the city. With 3,000 men, I can surround the city. He cannot escape. He's finished. Saul said, this is good news. God has delivered him. Look at that. Absolutely no discernment. <clears throat> Verse 8, Saul called all the people together for war. And the, all the people, the 3,000 especially, assigned warriors to assassinate David, to kill him. They go down to Keilah to besiege David. Now, here's my question. Why didn't they go down to Keilah when the Philistines were attacking Keilah? Saul didn't want to fight with the Philistines, but he takes 300 men to go to war against David, but he won't go to war and help that city against the Philistines. Now, if I was that city, I'd be able to have a little bit of misgivings about Saul. He has this new energy to come visit the city. <clears throat> but when they were being attacked, they had, he had no, no resolve to go. Verse 9, David knew <clears throat> Saul plotted evil against him. He told Abathar the priest, bring the ephod here with the Urim and the Thummim. Again, those two stones that were in the pockets of the ephod, the, uh, this linen garment. David said, O oh Lord God of Israel, your servant has certainly heard that Saul seeks to come up to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Question God, will the men of Keilah deliver me into his hands? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? The rumors have gone, you know, some people still do love David in the land. I pray thee, tell me, God. And God answers, Saul will come down to Keilah. <clears throat> David said, will the men of Keilah deliver me to the hands of Saul? I mean, surely I just defeated the Philistines for them. Surely there's a little gratitude in their heart. The Lord says, no, the men will betray you. So David and his men, about 600 rose, departed from there and it was told Saul that he escaped from Keilah, so he halted the expedition. I mean, this is another uh, bizarre experience. He might have been to Keilah maybe a couple weeks. It's, it's hard to know because he's fighting a mini war, a skirmish with the Philistines. I mean, he's risking his life. He's, he's obviously endeared himself to the people. They're, they're, I mean, a couple weeks at warfare, relationships undoubtedly have been established. And this city decides to, to betray David after he's risked his life. And David says, every time I turn around, it goes bad. Why would they betray me? Well, for two reasons. Number one, because of the massacre of the city of Nob. And that's why God massacred the priests to put fear in all the cities that would help him. They were afraid of Saul's wrath. And number two, Saul would give them a financial reward if they would help him. And so fear of, for their own safety and lust for their own gain. They said, David, you know, it's really great having you here, and, but uh, we need the money and uh, we can't afford Saul's anger. And they just betrayed him. I mean, imagine, here we go again. Kicked out of the king's court. 
running out in the wilderness. Jonathan, back and forth in the court. He lies. The city's massacred. The cave of Adullam, depression. He recovers. He goes to Keilah. Now the depression, or just the hit of this wholesale abandoning betrayal of him after he's risked his life again. He's been there for weeks. He didn't just meet him one day and say hi. He's been laboring with them in war. It could have been a month. It's hard to know. How long it took for the news to get the Saul for Saul to come down and, and, you know, and for David to defeat the Philistines there. Verse 14. Now David stayed in the strongholds in the wilderness. In a, like in the caves is what it's talking about. Well, Wait, but one more thing about Keilah. I think it's interesting that David wants to save the city again. He saved the city by going to Keilah against the Philistines. Now he saves the city by departing from there. It was David's heart to save the city. He's maintaining his integrity even though he's stumbling and fumbling. Verse 14, David stayed in the strongholds in the wilderness and remained in the mountains of the wilderness of Ziph. Saul sought him every day, but God did not deliver him into his hand. Now that's in just this quick little verse... Saul sought him every day. We're talking about an unrelenting attack day in and day out, day in and day out, day in and day out. If that's in the place of employment, it overwhelms us. You know, the, the person in the office, whether they're under us, beside us, or, or over us, unrelenting rumors and attack and barraging your character. Well, this was far more intense than this. They would have killed David. So you understand a little bit of what David said. But what you really need to understand, this is how God trains a worshiping warrior king. This is what God does in His seminary. Some of us say, Lord, what's the deal? The Lord says, I want you to discover who I am. That's what's going on, David. He's causing David to gain a history in God of God's faithfulness. So, God, so David knows that it was God that delivered him. And he has this history of watching God intervene so David's confidence in the Lord is bolstered. God wants David to realign his soul through pain. Every time the pain comes, he wants him to go through this, why am I even doing this, God? Because you've called me. You love me. I love you. Therefore, I'm successful. And God, David would have to realign his soul through the pressure. These, these constant new situations that are always happening. God wanted David to walk in the humility and the meekness and the tenderness of this struggle. Struggle causes tenderness and compassion to enter our hearts. Struggle causes us to realign our hearts with God. Struggle causes us to have opportunities where God gives us miracles. Breakthroughs, where the miracles are God breaks in and settles the thing for us in a way that's important to us. Those, those, uh, those uh, are like uh, trophies of the grace of God in our own private life in the Lord. Now, Ziph is also in Judah, by the way. Ziph is, is right in the area. Verse 15, And David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life, and he was in the wilderness of Ziph in the forest. Then Jonathan, here's the last visit, Saul's son arose. He went to David in the woods and strengthened his hand in God. This is a very interesting uh, verse. Number one, how can Jonathan find David, but nobody else can? Jonathan finds David like that. It's possible that David's in a position where he can see, see Saul's army maneuvering he sees Jonathan over there by himself, and he knows Jonathan's looking for him. That's why he's alone. And maybe sends a guy and brings Jonathan to him. But I, it's kind of interesting to watch the commentators figure, try to sort this one out. But I, my theory is that he saw him from a high position and sent a guy and says, Come on in. Jonathan speaks the word of the Lord to him, strengthens him. He said to him, Do not fear, for the hand of, my, of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You will be king. I will be next to you. Even my father, Saul, knows that. He goes, I want you to know I'm in the inner councils. My dad knows you're the anointed of the Lord. So does the entire court. And we find some years later that, that uh, Abner, the, uh, the uh, high commander, the main general of the army, says, we always knew that you were the anointed one. And David says, well, why didn't you stand with me? Well, Saul would get really mad. You know, we had to try to kill you. Sorry, I mean, we knew you were God's chosen. I mean, just think what David has to go through with all this information. So he looks at John and he goes, Your dad knows that I'm the anointed? He goes, Yeah, he really does. And he says, I know you're going to prevail. The two of them made a covenant. Now they've, it's, it's the same covenant that they're reestablishing. Now these, this verse leaves me feeling funny. Because Jonathan is 
prophesying to David the truth. Jonathan is speaking the word of the Lord. But Jonathan doesn't have enough grace to stand with David and to break his, his alliance with Saul and his evil rage against the anointing of the Lord. I believe with all of my heart it was God's will for Jonathan to look at his father and say, No, I'm standing with David. I believe that our loyalty is first to the Lord and second to relationships. And I believe that my personal conviction is that it was a failure of Jonathan and he dies in the wilderness with unsanctified mercy and loyalty and unsanctified loyalty towards his father and he dies in the wilderness. He should have been reigning next to David for 40 years with David, but he couldn't ever pull away from the apron strings, if you will, but it was from his father. He had enough insight to prophesy the word of the Lord. He had enough insight to ask David for a covenant because he knew who David was. He was loyal to David, but only in as much as it didn't disrupt his welfare. When it, when it began to infringe upon his lifestyle, his loyalty had, had a line. He wouldn't chase David, but neither would he stand with David under pressure. And so lots, I've heard several sermons over the years about Saul and how good he is. I mean, Jonathan, Jonathan kind of bugs me, to be honest. I, I've seen guys like that over the years. They have the Word of the Lord. They have the understanding. But they won't stand in the pressure. Don't be a Jonathan. Verse 19. Anyway, this is the last time they, they see each other. Jonathan dies, as far as I'm concerned, prematurely out of the will of God on Mount Gilboa against the Philistines. He should have never have died against the Philistines. God has anointed David to defeat the Philistines and Jonathan is in covenant with the man anointed to defeat the Philistines, and the Philistines kill Jonathan. David, Jonathan, that should not have been. Don't be a Jonathan. Have revelation and understanding and all the good relationship, but you can't quite take a stand when the heat's on. That's a little sub kind of theme that the writer for Samuel puts into here. Then the, the Ziphites came up to David to Saul at Gibeah. Of course, that's the capital, that's up north. Saying, is not David hiding with us in the strongholds? So the Ziphites, which is real close to Keilah, they send messengers up to the capital, up to Gibeah, and say, hey, we found him. What will you give us? You know, and they're going to get a reward. That's not said here, but that, that's Saul, every time Saul does something, he always gives a reward. It's his standard. Verse 20, therefore, O king, come down according to all the desire of your soul. And our part shall be to deliver David into your hands so you can kill him. Saul says, Oh, blessed are you of the Lord. Oh, I can't stand the language. For you have compassion on me. Remember back in chapter 22, he's under the tree and he goes, Nobody cares about me. King Saul, here he is. 3,000 men at his disposal, just a waste to chase a fugitive. He goes, You really do have compassion on me. I mean, victim language to the max. He says, he's crafty. He goes, go really get this clear. Don't tell anybody you told me. And to get it clear, he's very crafty. See, therefore, and take knowledge of all the lurking places where he hides. Come back to me with certainty, and I'll go with you. And it shall be that if he is in the land, that I will search for him throughout all the clans, every, every family of Judah. I'll find him if he's down there. I want to get this over with. They arose, they went to Ziph before Saul. David and his men were in the wilderness of Moan. All in the same area. Saul and his men went to seek him. And then the people told David, Saul has been informed, he's been tipped off by the Ziphites, and they're coming after you. All 3,000 soldiers. Therefore he went down to the rock and stayed in the wilderness of Moan. Saul heard it, and he pursued him in the wilderness there. Then Saul went on one side of the mountain, David and his men on the other side of the mountain. David made haste to get away, for Saul look, and his men were encircling David. They took him. They had him all surrounded. David goes, oh, no. He goes, how did this happen? I mean, panic strikes his heart. Verse 27, a messenger comes running to Saul. Hurry. You can see the guy out of breath. Saul, hurry, hurry. Come. The Philistines have invaded the land up north around your house. They're burning the villages. They're, they're destroying everything. And Saul goes, oh, this is how could this happen to me? So Saul had to return. From pursuing David, he had him ambushed, I mean, had him surrounded, and the whole bit. I mean, again, look at David's life. The Ziphites betray him. The men of Keilah betray him. He has his fresh victory. He's, in the, he's encircled in the wilderness of Moan, and 
then the divine breakthrough comes in. I mean, look at the number of ways where Saul Saul's coming after David and the spirit of prophecy comes on him and they can't attack. Saul's coming after David and Jonathan tells inter, intercedes and tells David and David goes somewhere else. Saul's coming after David and David's and uh, wife, Michael, lies and David escapes. There's like, well, there's probably about 15 total, but I, one time I went and I wrote down all the times where David escaped. Through, and every one of them was diverse as, as imaginable. And the Lord is saying, I have as much creativity as, the, as I've made the stars. I can do it any way I want because Saul is like a little puppet to me. I can do anything with Saul. David, Saul's not your problem. Your problem is, is that you're called to be king of Israel and I'm jealous for you and I'm training you. Saul is not your problem, David. I've shown you in every way imaginable I can stop Saul. Saul is not my problem. Saul's not your problem. The issue at hand, David, is I'm giving you a history in me. I'm causing you to realign your heart in me. I'm creating meekness and tenderness in you so you can be a good king for the nation in the future. Okay, let's just go for a, a, just a... A few brief moments to Psalm 54. This is the psalm. It's a very short psalm. Psalm 54. Look, it says, the contemplation of David when the Ziphites went and said to Saul, is not David hiding with us? That's what it says in the, uh, right under the uh, Psalm 54 in the inscription up there. The outline, verses 1 to 3, it's David's prayer for help. This opens David's heart and what he was thinking and feeling. Verse 1 to 3 is the prayer for help. Verse 4 to 5 is his confidence. Verse 6 and 7 is his, it's his uh, voluntary love or his gratitude. His praise that's actually based in gratitude is what it is. I like to call it his voluntary love. It's the, it's the praise he has, but it's rooted in his gratitude. I like the inscription, is, not, is David not hiding with us? It was kind of like it was a real righteous and loyal thing for them to go to the king. David, he's hiding with us. And the king pats him on the back. You've shown me compassion. You're a good man. And that became like a little motto that the, that the town, we're the ones that help the king. But guys, that's going to show up at the judgment seat of Christ. I don't think you really want that little banner hanging over your town. But it became kind of a phrase that became well known in the community at that time. They were the ones that stood for the king. Now remember, we have kicked out of the court. The lies at the city of Nob. Faking insanity before Achish king of Gath. The depression at Adullam. The betrayal at Keilah. The betrayal from the Ziphites. The trauma that he experienced encircled by 3,000 men about to be killed and suddenly at the last minute of 5 till 12, 12 he's delivered. I mean, David's saying, Lord, just give me one easy month. That's all I'm asking for. Just one. Imagine all of that in three or four months. Imagine the state of this man's heart. The varied situations of David's life God has used as instruction for the saints. It's interesting that David's trapped in 1 Samuel 23, betrayed, you know, by Keilah, betrayed by the Ziphites, and trapped around the wilderness of Moan. And in chapter 24, everything is going to be reversed. Saul is going to go into a cave, fall asleep, the one that David is in, and David's going to have salt in his spirit. Everything is going to be reversed the next chapter. Now, David doesn't know this, but God knows it. It's all written in God's book. David doesn't know chapter 24. Saul's going to be on the end of his spear in just a couple weeks. Or a month or two. Who knows? Verse 1. Save me, O God, by Your name. Vindicate me by Your strength. Now the issue on David's mind is, of course, the issue of Saul. The issue that I'm being accused falsely. Vindicate my name. Set the record straight. Don't let these lies going around everywhere that I caused the city to be slaughtered because I've done evil against Saul. The city was slaughtered of Nob because he lied. But, I mean, the rumors about David were spreading across the whole nation. David, it's just really bad. He's going, Lord, I am in such a mess. There is no way out anywhere. i got everybody mad at me in the nation. 
vindicate me, set the record straight, somehow cause things to turn and establish me again. That's what he's saying. It's a massive prayer he's asking for here. He says, by your name, it's this, it's that Psalm 27, when the Lord says to David in verse 8, David says, Lord, help me, help me, help me. And the Lord says, seek my face. And David says, your face, O God, I will seek. God's constantly bringing David to the knowledge of his name, to the, to the personality of God. It's the name, which means the face of God, his personality. David is interacting with the, the person of who God is. Not just, he's not just some mechanical saving power. There's a real person that God is saying, Seek my face. Seek my name, David. Those are synonymous concepts. And I will set the record straight in time. Not that you'll always have the record straight on the earth, but I will judge between you and, and I will change things in my season. Verse 2, Hear my prayer. Give ear. There's the time when David wrestles in prayer. and We read those verses and it's kind of like, goes, okay, no. Beloved, verse 2 is, is like a serious verse. Verse 2 wasn't like something he just whispered on the way. This is the principle. He puts the name of the Lord in front of him, verse 1. He goes through the wrestling match in prayer. There is a wrestling match in prayer. God first lays hold of you and lets you lay hold of Him. God first draws you and He says, now wrestle with me and I'll let you pin me to the mat. Michael Sullivan had a dream, a very powerful dream, that he was a little boy and he was wrestling his father. And his father, he pinned his father and his father, he's, Michael was only about six years old. I mean, he, he's dreaming and as an adult, goes back when he was six and he pins his father, his, smile, his father's smiling and then the Lord speaks to him that, the fa his father has great joy in letting his young son pin him. And the Lord says, And I have great joy when I let you wrestle me and pin me, but I want you to wrestle with me. I want you to go through the wrestling, prayer, the wrestling match in prayer. I'm not going to just do it. I want you to wrestle with me. Verse 2 is essential. We say, well, no, we just want verse 1. We want to put the name of the Lord. We want to meditate on the attributes of God, which we're going to look at the next session. But we don't want to. We have the name of God before us. Now we wrestle through. There's, there's that wrestling match. It sometimes takes weeks, sometimes months, sometimes years. Some of you are going, ugh. The wrestling match flows out of the revelation of His name. You never ever persevere in wrestling in verse 2 unless you have an accurate view of the beauty of God, the name of God in verse 1. Psalm 27, Your beauty, O Lord! And that's the very psalm when God said, seek my face when you're in trouble. David says, no, help my circumstances. God says, no, seek my face. Look at my beauty. And that will, that, that's what strengthens us to wrestle. He complains in verse 3, strangers have risen up, oppressors. Now the strangers is Saul and his court. The stranger is the, is the men of Keilah. The strangers are the men of Ziph. I mean, he knew them all. But he goes, these are, these are men that are, that are, uh, uh, Opposed to me. They're not friends. They're strangers. They're not my friends. But he's talking directly because he's writing this from the time when, when, they're, uh, when they're chasing him at Zip. New enemies keep appearing in every new circumstance. There's a new set of enemies, but there's a new revelation of God with every new set of enemies in every new circumstance. New circumstances bring new enemies. New enemies bring new breakthroughs and new understanding, new experiences in the Lord. David says, he says in verse 3, the end, they've not set God before them. David disassociates himself in some ways. He goes, I don't take it personal. Their problem, the reason why they're so fearful and they'll sell me out for, for a buck, the reason is because they don't fear the Lord. He goes, really, it's about you and them, God. It's not about me and them. See, Saul, nobody has pity on me. David says, it's not about me and these guys betraying me. They don't know God, and that's why they betray me. David had the ability to ascertain really what the problem was. Verse 4, the great statement. If we find this, we're going to find this in the next session. It comes at the great times. Behold God. He's wrestling in prayer in verse 2 and 3. Then Selah, the end of verse 3, there's a pause. Then suddenly, behold God. There's a breakthrough of God in his soul. That fresh anointing of the Lord. Behold God. He sees God as the helper of his soul. Remember, he's at Ziph and all this long list of things have happened against him. Prayer, the wrestling match, brings this into a new revelation. Again, 
We, we, we meditate in verse 1 in the name of God, and that's good. We like that. Then the wrestling match, we get tired of it. But I tell you, you wrestle. Behold God! A new awareness, a new breakthrough, a new spirit of revelation begins to break through in the midst of our pain and struggle. And beloved, I don't care what any of us are going through. Nobody has gone through what David did in the three months before he wrote that. When he said, Behold God! He's my helper. This is real, he said. This isn't just some mechanical doctrine. Enemies everywhere, but he sees God is outnumbering his enemies, outsmarting his enemies, outpowering his enemies. He goes, God, you're, you're far more powerful than my enemies. And when the soul of a believer says, Behold God, He is my help, beloved, that is when life begins to take on a whole new flavor. God is my champion. I'm not mad at the Ziphites. I'm not mad at the men of Keilah. I'm not mad at Saul. God is my champion. I don't need those men to vote for me. God is my champion. And that's what kept David free from bitterness. He found a new revelation. Behold God, and he found a new champion. He didn't need, quote, the pastor to say yes or no about him being important. He had a new champion. He dwelt in the heavens. His name is Jesus. He knows me and I know him. Behold, that's where I stand before him. I don't have to go around and get everybody's approval on the earth. What a powerful reality. With this kind of reality, he could be a good king. You get a leader with that kind of reality, he doesn't have to be political. He doesn't have to fear in a crisis. The problem of leadership today, because there's so little experiential knowledge of God when the crisis comes, it's so easy for us to kick into the political spirit mode, to the fear of man mode, to start moving in the realm of the human. Behold God! And the God that I'm beholding is my helper. There's two things. Number one, a revelation of God. And number two, the revelation of God is a helper. Verse 5, He will repay. There's a time when the enemies will brought be, be defeated is the point. The enemies will be defeated. That's what that, there's a lots of, of sub-thoughts under He will repay my enemies. But in this context, the enemies are defeated. Victory is shining in His soul. Victory. The enemy that plagues me will not, will not always be there. Could be a relational problem. Could be a financial problem. Could be a healing problem. Could be a ministry barrenness problem. Could be a a whole lot of people against you problem. The behold God. He will remove the enemy. Your heart will soar in the Lord again. And then he says this in verse 6. Oh, it's so good. Well, in verse 6, he goes, at the very end, he says, Oh God, I praise Your name for it's good. He discovers that goodness again. That sounds like Psalm 52 and Psalm 57. Oh, You're good. Oh, the name of God is good. You treat me good. Someone might have said, Treat you good? Well, number one, one group says you lied and had that city slaughtered. You act like a madman before Achish. You don't deserve deserve good treatment. Another guy says, treat you good. They delivered you in Keilah. They betrayed you at Ziph. They encircled you at the... He goes, yeah, but the Lord's with me, you guys. And they go, David, you've got a weird view of life. One group was mad that he had confidence in the Lord because he should have been in probation for all of his mistakes. And the other group was... Thought he was living in denial because he had joy. He connected with the goodness of God even before everything was settled. And then look at how he ends in verse 6. He goes, I will freely sacrifice. That's the, uh, that's the free will offering. That's the, 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 the offerings above and beyond that which is, is required. He makes a commitment to the Lord. I'm going to give you voluntary love. I'm going to give you that which you've not even asked for. I'm going to give you out of the overflow of my, dis- my gratitude because of the discovery of your goodness. Amen. Let's stand. Lord, we love You. Oh, God, we say, Behold, God. Lord, we want to put the name of the Lord before us. We want to go through the wrestling match. Lord, we say that all those people, even though we know them, they treat us like strangers. They betray us. But it's not really the problem. The problem is they don't really fear You. They don't really... Honor what you're about. That's okay. We release them. Behold our God. My champion has appeared before me by the Spirit of Revelation. My heart is strengthened. Behold, my champion says that he will help me in due time. Oh, and I love you. I will offer free sacrifices. Lord, I will give to you the free will offering. I will willingly give you more than you've ever asked from me because of gratitude. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. 
For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.